right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to um, this evening's Planning and Development Committee meeting. Uh, get my little agenda here. Uh, it is Monday, April 22nd, 2019, um, and we have a quorum, so I declare our meeting a call us to order. Um, our first item of uh, business is approval of regular meeting minutes of April 8th, 2019. Do I have a motion to approve? approval. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Thank you. Unanimous approval. Okay. Um, our our first item of business, I'm just going to get it introduced and then we'll have, we have a number of um, speakers who want to offer their public comment. Um, so this is uh, consideration of ordinance 112-0-18 uh, uh, granting major zoning relief for building lot coverage, setbacks, and open parking at 2626 Reese Avenue. Um, do I have to read the whole thing? <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, so the applicant has submitted revised plans, and um, that's, those are the plans that we're going to be considering tonight. Do I have a motion to approve? So okay. So now we are ready to um, hear public comment about this. First, uh, Richard Horsting. So basically we have um, about 16 uh, public speakers, and so if everyone um, can keep their remarks to a couple of minutes, then we'll be able to get um, promptly through our agenda here. Good evening. Good evening, I'm Richard Horsting. I would like to ask, first of all, how many people here on this committee have actually gone out and see, seen this site in person? Okay, all right. Well, my, my. So am, am I allowed to pass out, I have material I want to pass out to everybody on this, am I allowed to do that in this time frame? Uh, well, why don't you give your remarks and then you can pass out your... Okay, that's fine. Mm -hmm. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm tired. I'm stressed and I'm annoyed that this case has been going on now for over three years. This ridiculous proposal is asking for major double digit percentage variance requests on 11 sides of the house, the deck, the basement, and garage. Not small variances. I would be open to small variances, but these are double digit percentage variances that he's requesting. For over three years, the city council, P and D, and the ZBA has heard all of these issues affecting my house, my neighbors, and the neighborhood. The ZBA has already unanimously denied the plan twice. We, my neighbors and I, have already brought to attention the following major issues for 2626 plan. Major double digit variance requests, structural engineering reports by Wade Clark, one of the fine structural engineers in the world, major damage to my home from a nine foot deep basement. Remember, this is a 25 foot lot, my house and the corner lot, and my next door neighbors at 2622. Water runoff, Grading, sewer, parking, and flood control have all been brought up. Building lot coverage ratio has been brought up. Grandfathered in 1925 house mine and my next door neighbor's house, 1940. Public safety concerns, parking, trees, et cetera, et cetera. We looked up 25 foot corner lot homes in Northwest Evanston. There isn't any. Violations overlooked by the City of Evanston's Health Department, Ordinance IPMC-30T.4, Weeds and Grass, all premises and exterior property shall be maintained from weeds or plant growth in excess of eight inches. I have weed trees growing there that are 25 foot tall, everywhere. No basement at 2622 over structural concerns from 1940 to my house at, 19, at 2624. They didn't build it back then because they were concerned about what it would do to my house. And lastly, I don't trust the city of Evanston or Mr. James anymore. This kick the can down approach to the aforementioned serious issues that will be resolved if only Mr. James is allowed to build is dangerous. It will set a dangerous precedent by disregarding current and future zoning laws that have been established to eliminate these issues. What would stop a developer from tearing down a house on a 50-foot lot and building two houses on 
25 foot lots if this was allowed to go. Please look at the facts we have presented against the building at 2626 and vote with the majority of all my neighbors against this egregious plan. So, Mr. Horsting, can, mm -hmm. can you, are you about wrapped up? Wrapped I just up? want to pass out okay, fine. some major, major handouts. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, next, we have Joseph Parody. Go ahead. Okay. Just, um, uh, my name is Joseph Parody. I'm at 2907 Hartzell. As the Planning and Development Committee considers the proposal for 2626 Reese Avenue, I want to highlight both the outcome and the process, since those are the focus of my concerns and the reason I believe that P&D should deny the appeal on this application. The latest proposal for this property, which is not the same as the proposal that was rejected by the ZBA, has certain changes that attempt to address some of the previously stated concerns, but introduces other changes that compound some of those concerns. While the bulk of the house has been reduced slightly, the house now has a 10-foot high basement with only one foot above ground. The currently proposed basement will exacerbate the existing flooding concerns in the neighborhood and increase the chance that construction will negatively impact the property to the south. The street side setback variance requested has not changed, and it continues to be out of character with the rest of the neighborhood. As city staff mentions in their memo for this meeting, quote, appropriate zoning relief is determined by comparing similar conditions throughout a neighborhood, addressing potential concerns, and assessing whether the variations requested meet the standards for approval, end of quote. In this case, the revised proposal has never been submitted to the ZBA, so there's no way to determine if zoning relief is appropriate. Per Evanston Zoning Code, the ZBA is the body that evaluates those three criteria, not the city staff. I and many neighbors have stated many times in the past and continue to insist that any new proposal be submitted to the ZBA and evaluated by them. In the last full review of this proposal by P&D, a request was made of the city staff to understand how this application compares to other developments on similar lots. Only one other case exists in the last 55 years since the current zoning code has been in existence, 1928 Foster Street, which was developed in 2000. That property has no garage, is three feet wider than this lot, and has no air conditioning and an unfinished basement, according to Cook County records. It also has a larger street y side yard setback. What one can conclude from this analysis is the applicant does have further opportunity to change the proposal to address the many concerns in a way that the ZBA could approve. The final process item I would like to raise concerns the proposed ordinance before you tonight. As city staff notes in their memo, the ordinance is written to allow the prior proposal, not the current proposal, if that ordinance were passed, it would allow the applicant to ignore the updated proposal and essentially bypass the efforts to address the concerns of the neighbors and the ZBA. While I firmly believe this proposal should be denied, any ordinance should reflect the correct variance requests and limits. In conclusion, I urge P&D to deny this appeal and ask that any new proposal follow the correct process for evaluation by the appropriate city bodies. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Kirkpatrick. I live at uh, 2904, which is just a j across the alley from the uh, property in question. <clears throat> and I'd like to just to read for what the, uh, the ZBA said. Specifically, the Zoning Board of Appeals determined the proposal does not meet all the standards for major variations. Specifically, the proposal would result in a substan substantial excuse me, adverse impact on the use, enjoyment, or property values of adjoining properties. Okay, they've looked at this twice and came to that same conclusion. Has living next door to it and across where it would come in, uh, come in through the alley, where all the water would have to come in because you can't send it any other place except into the alley, um, I believe that this uh, project would have a significant adverse effect on the enjoyment of our house and its property value. And so I would request that it go back to the ZBA where it belongs, if not um, over, overruled entirely. And I would just like to point out that the ZBA on, on every occasion that when they met with um, the builder said they felt that he was not going to the degree that he could in order to comport with their rules and regulations. Um, and so we feel like the ZBA should be the ones that um, review uh, this new. And I would also like to echo Joseph. We're not sure what ordinance we're talking about because the ordinance is very different than the plans. And so I would be questioning what are you actually voting on? Because we don't know either. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Danachek. Uh, 
Hi, I'm Jim Janicek. I'm not a neighbor. I'm from the Ninth Ward. I have no issue with the aesthetics of this proposed structure. I don't care how high it is. I don't care what color it is. I don't care. It could be a windowless block of concrete. I'm here because this applicant constructed a very similar home on the property next door to me 12 years ago. The construction involved a full height basement, almost identical to the one proposed here. Initially, there was a sump pump discharge located at the midpoint of the building, which seemed to discharge water 24 seven, rain or shine. The water flowed onto our property until we complained. At which point, the applicant dug a trench from the front of the house to the alley. He lined it with gravel and put in a large perforated pipe. This terminated at the alley with a catch basin that had a 12 inch grate on top. He connected the sump pump to this pipe. The water stopped running onto our property and I thought nothing of it. Problem solved. Until one day, I noticed a stream of water flowing down the property down the alley while the surrounding area was dry. It was coming up through the grates. From the catch basins. If the water was overflowing up out of these catch basins, that means the perforated drain pipe was full to capacity thanks to the sump pumps working constantly. The amount of water being discharged from the property was more than the surrounding permeable surface could handle. I thought this was very odd, so I took some pictures. I continued to take a picture every day for 12, no, sorry, seven days. I don't see how the property proposed at 2626 Reese would be any different than what I just described. Digging down to put a full height basement in will most likely cause the exact same scenario or possibly worse. This property will now be discharging possibly hundreds of gallons of water a day from 10 to 12 feet down, and where will it go? The neighbor's yard, across the sidewalks, into the alley? At the last ZBA meeting, the applicant was asked about this. Both Mr. Joseph and Mr. James replied they would deal with it later with staff during the permitting process. 12 years ago, the applicant did not have a plan for where this water would go. 12 years later, he still does not seem to have a plan. And I'm not sure what concerns me more, that after 12 years, he has not learned anything or that he just doesn't care. I'm here because I do care about these words from the city code. Some pumps and discharge from other sources, including downspouts, shall not discharge upon a public way, nor be directed towards adjacent properties, and shall be drained upon the premises without causing retention of stagnant water thereon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Clark. Good evening. <coughs> My name is Jeff Clark. I currently uh, own the property at 2815 Hartzell, maybe 150 feet away. Um, Dick Horstein was talking about uh, the property on the other side of his house. And it happens that I owned that house for 13 or 14 years. Uh, the house does not have a basement. There's a crawl space under most of the house. And the only, uh, only step down is to a utility room and that was that was four steps down now uh, I've been in Mr. Horstein's basement uh, and tonight he mentioned again that the only problem that his current structure has is where adjacent to where that small small excavation took place and I can't imagine what would happen if structure on the other side had a full basement that would uh, uh, certainly cause some disruption in the in the uh, in the soil and the undersoil in that area uh, again I don't want to repeat what's already been said I concur with what's been said but I do want to repeat one thing that I've said at every one of these meetings the only way currently using normal processes that uh, Mr. James can build on that <laughs> boy, on that uh, lot. Actually, there's two ways. He can acquire uh, Mr. Horstein's home, and thereby he has a 50-foot yacht, 
or a lot, <laughs> and uh, and he can build pretty much what he wants to build right now. The other way is that the city, through a normal process, uh, either reclassifies the neighborhood uh, and or changes the setbacks. Those are the only two ways. Anything else is is just uh, just creating exotic variances to allow them to do this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Kathy Miller. Thank you, I'm Kathy Miller, 2831 Hartzell, directly across the street from the subject property. Um, I, I share the same concern that Mary Beth Burns had when they itemized why the Zoning Board of Appeals rejected this application. This is going to still have a two foot tall, 30, 50 foot long wall of a building, three feet, about three and a half feet from the sidewalk. She had said that this would change the character of our neighborhood, and I believe her. I agree with that. Um, and I am hoping that you will honor with the zoning board, the time and effort that they put in with their knowledge, I hope you will honor that and reject this application. My second point is that for 19 years, the change the city council enacted at that time, rules regarding substandard lots, has not caused any problems. For some reason, the staff seems interested in building on substandard lots that are now grandfathered. Don't, don't break something that's fixed. I've just emailed you a picture of another hole where a tree has been lost on Hartzell Street. I emailed that to each of you. Citizens Greener Evanston has reminded us that our valuable urban forest is under intense pressure. I think we all know this. Evanston's own website says, sadly, the city of Evanston has been losing trees at a high rate due to extenuating circumstances such as Dutch elm, emerald ash borer infestation, storm damage um, on the parks, parkways, greenways. I've lost trees and now have a tiny one on my parkway. Evanston's Parkway Tree Planting Program is, desi is designed to replace those trees. Evanston even has a tax-deductible I Heart Evanston Trees campaign on the city's website. Please do not let this builder endanger the large trees we still have. Please reject this application. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rob Coons, if, I, if I'm reading this properly. No, thanks. Good evening. My name is Rob Coons. I live at 2617 Lincolnwood, which shares an alley with this property. You've heard from a number of my neighbors already about many of the concerns, and certainly my wife and I share all of those, especially the drainage concern um, on the alley in, a, in an area where we already have a significant flooding issue, as, as much of the city does. Continuing to drain more and more water into this alley in this public way is just going to exacerbate the issue for all of us in the neighborhood. The other major issue that we haven't talked about yet that I think is, is just as important, as, if not more so than everything we've talked about so far, this is a safety issue. There are a large number of young children that live in this neighborhood that walk along this route to Willard School every day. And this proposal has alternated over the three years from everything from a two-car garage to a one-car garage with a parking pad, all of it requesting a variance on the setback from the alley itself. It's already incredibly difficult to see anyone walking down the street and coming around this alley. If we allow this property to build a massive structure right up against this alley, it's going to become almost impossible. This alley shares a setback with commercial properties on along Central Street as well. There are people that do not live in this neighborhood that use this alley that fly through it at 25, 30 miles an hour every single day. And I think we're just a matter of time before somebody gets into a serious accident here if we allow another blind spot without preserving a sight triangle here. And the point that was made earlier 
about how this, this variance continues to bounce back and forth. We don't know what you're voting on tonight. You don't know what you're voting on tonight. And without knowing that, I think it's very dangerous to take a vote and approve something that you don't understand fully. So I would urge you again, like, like all of my neighbors have, please reject this proposal tonight. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Uh, Kim Newman. And then Mark Newman after that. Hi, I'm Kim Newman. I'm 2833 Hartzell, right across the street from the proposed house. There's two things I'm worried about. One is parking and the latest plan, there was only a one car garage. We have one of the narrowest streets in Evanston. All the business people on Central Street park on our street. With the one car parking, I don't even know where another, most of us have old houses with one car garages. I don't even know where a car, another car could go on the street. Another thing is, which is short term, but when they were built, if they build this house, I don't even know where they could put a dumpster. I mean, it is a tiny lot. It gets at a corner. I can't even see a truck coming to deliver materials. It's one way parking on both sides already. So I just kind of think it's just not doable. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Mark Newman. Hi, thank you for uh, seeing us. Um, I have a couple points. First of all, I'm one of the few people that's actually seen the water table that goes underneath the houses. And so I know how deep the water table has been and it's approximately eight to nine inches underneath the foundation of all these houses. So when you take into account adding more water, you should take into account where the water table actually is and since I've seen it, I know what that, will, what that would mean. I'd like to echo my wife on this narrow street. We only park on one side. Uh, it used to have two-sided parking. They stopped that because emergency vehicles would not be able to get by. If we do this construction and they've locked the street and there is something that needs an emergency vehicle, it will not be able to get by either. The parking is limited. So I'm, I'm very worried about that. The third thing is I'd like to say is that I echo all the other stuff that everyone is saying. And I would say, you know, we've asked for three years answers to the same question regarding the water, the structural, the trees, and we are still waiting for an answer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Ann Herder. Hi, I'm Ann Herter. I live at 2837 Hartzell, which is directly across from the street from the property. And um, I've pretty much heard all my concerns expressed by my neighbors, so I don't need to repeat them all, but mm -hmm. I would like to say that I'm in agreement that um, I really think the proposed building is inappropriate for considering the size of the lot for the reasons stated. All right, thank you. Uh, Colleen Barkley. <coughs> Hello, Colleen Barkley at 2622 Reese. I am adjacent to two lots down from the applicant next to Dick Horstein's. Um, I want to echo my neighbors. I agree with them, and I want to just highlight three points that are um, personal to my beliefs. And in, in one is the safety of, of the alley. We share with the commercial um, alley with this as it tees into it. We get a lot of traffic already coming from those businesses shooting down the alley. So site triangles are important, whether it's a one or a two car garage, it's still a blind spot. Um, number two is the trees. I'm here to advocate for the trees. Um, there's two heritage trees, an oak on Mr. Horstein's property that extends the canopy into the lot, and then an elm on the parkway that's over 30 inches that the canopy extends as well, which is the critical root zone. So I want to give these trees um, lungs and not cut them off with root pruning and eventually be lost in time. And then thirdly is the flooding. Um, I actually have a picture I'll share with you that you can pass around of our yard, um, probably what I'll walk home to tonight. 
after these storms. But our flooding is unbelievable. We have a pond. Every time it rains, it takes two days to go down. And um, I can only imagine what a 10-foot basement would do um, to this beyond um, my neighbors, mine, and then extend into the alley and even onto the sidewalks. So I know we say there's a setback of 10 feet from the property to take a downspout and let it relieve. Um, we have that scenario very close to us. The sidewalk ices up and is either full of ice or water, you know, two-thirds of the year. So here's the photo, so thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, I'm going to have trouble with the handwriting on this one. Um, Darwall, maybe, is the last name. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about my handwriting. That's okay. I'm Charles Darwell. I've lived in, uh, in Evanston at 2653 Reese for about 17 years now. Uh, now. And, um, you know, this is all about variance. And I can tell you there's no variance in how the neighbors feel about this. Uh, you guys have been looking at this for three years. This is the first time I've come here to City Hall. Um, I don't quite know why this is continuing. Um, if there's any question what the, what the neighbors want, the community wants, you know, I think they have precedence, and I'll be honest with you. Um, yes, I pay premium in taxes, and I think all of you live in Evanston, and you all pay premium in taxes, right? So we pay more taxes than Skokie. We don't live there. We don't live in Wilmette. We don't live in Chicago. I don't live in Chicago because I don't want that high density. I don't want that kind of a zoning. I love coming out of my house. I love the street. I love the trees. I love the experience. So what am I really paying for, right? I'm paying for an experience. So. It's very clear the neighbors don't want this. So my question to you is why are we even continuing to discuss this, right? So I think my position is pretty clear on this. Uh, no, no, and no. And I think that if there's another hearing on this, I'll be back. And I'm just hoping there won't be. So thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Bill Sale. So we've been at this for two years and I've been coming to these meetings and, and I've been listening to all those meetings and what's going on here tonight, trying to, de to decide in my own mind, what, what is the narrative of this thing that we've been going through for the past two years? And here's the best that I can come up with. We, we have this application for some zoning variances. We, we have um, uh, neighbors we're going to have to live with whatever happens. You know, we have reassurances, reassurances like these things probably won't happen, but year after year after year, we have to live with whether or not they actually do or, or do not. Uh, the applicant will come in and build a structure, sell the structure, does not have to live with anything that happens from this point on. And, um, we have a, a tax base that would benefit for an amount that would be hardly a rounding error. And uh, my neighbors and I, I think many of us uh, long for uh, a government somewhere, somewhere in our country uh, where decisions are based on facts. And I think that uh, the benefit of the doubt uh, should go with uh, the neighbors who have to uh, live with this decision for as long as we all live here. And for the factual uh, uh, thing that, that we have presented criteria, which we say they have not been met, and ZBA has, has criteria which they say have not been met, uh, and staff has given us uh, uh, a list of precedents, uh, all but one of which happened between 1901 and 1963. So factually, let's go with the criteria, let's go with the neighbors who have to live with the results of this, uh, and it would be a very uh, refreshing experience for those of us who live in this community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Michael, well, no, it starts with a B. <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, Troy Denser. <clears throat> Hi.
Hi, I live at 2654 Reese. I've lived there for 54 years. Um, I pretty much agree with everything that everybody has said. This proposed development is way too large for the size of the lot. If you stand and put your hands out to people, touch hands, that's the size of the lot, and you're going to put a house on there, it's, it's just way too large for that lot size. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and then, oh, I don't know, does this say Mary? Mary? Nancy, okay. Oh, Nancy, that could be. <laughs> Sorry. That's Thank you for hearing all of us neighbors. Mm -hmm. I want you to know that we love neighbors. It's not about that. We love children. We have a great neighborhood for kids. And any family that would like a small home to move into a wonderful neighborhood and go to Willard School, this would be great. And I think Evanston would welcome smaller, affordable homes for people who can just start out and find a nice place to live in a great community like ours. And as you can see, we're a neighborhood that bonds together on important issues. We care about each other. So I just ask that if, and I must say, I think this lot's too small to build anything on, but if a house is going to be built there, I think it would be wonderful to build a house that fits the lot, fits the neighborhood, and does not impact negatively the rest of us. And I would ask that these major variances not be granted. And thank you for hearing us. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, that's the end of my list. I hope that's everybody. Um, so, committee, it's um, any, I throw it open to, to you all for your, <coughs> do I have any lights on yet? Uh, Alderman suffered in um, Everyone said everything that there is to be said. Uh, I hope that we'll all vote to reject this. Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. Um, well, if you'd like to come say something, sure. Um, I don't want to um, lengthen the, the process any longer. It's been a very long and arduous process. I, too, am. am uh, uh, I'm tired of three years of, of trying to get uh, a right that I believe I have as owning the property. Um, my comments will focus on three things, the staff report, a matter of fairness, and rational decision, based, rational decision making based on the rules. So regarding the staff report, I think I want to commend the staff on a research-based, fact-based recommendation. If you read the recommendation, they, they went through all of the data uh, on uh, the characteristics of the neighborhood in terms of the house heights, the sizes, the yards, all of these things. Um, uh, I think staff did what the city asked it to do, which was to uh, determine whether the proposed application fit in with the neighborhood, fit with the characteristics. Of the and staff said, that it did. Uh, they recommended two modifications, which frankly are significant impacts to the livability and um, attractiveness of the house. Um, I prepared um, uh, some slight modifications of the building plans to see if those uh, the, the modification of the roof design could, could work, and that's what you have before you. That's the reason why I did it. Uh, I need some minor change in uh, the gables on the second floor roof in order to make the thing work. It's still not ideal. It's not as good in terms of livability as, uh, as, as the, the gamble roof design, uh, but I needed to do those modifications to see if it would work. And it is something that I could live with. I, I think in some ways staff found a way to, what do they call it, uh, split the baby, <laughs> you know. I, I, I'm certainly not overjoyed at the two modifications, but I can live with them. Um, it's much better than um, not having any house to build at all, as, and which I never thought it would come to pass because I believe I have a right there. I believe staff believes that. I believe legally I have a right to build a house there, um, and that's why I pursued this all this all this time. So I commend staff on a fact-based uh, uh, report and recommendation um, on the matter of fairness. Um, I first want to say that um, I feel aggrieved by the, um, uh, uh, by the hearings I've gotten from the ZBI, I do but not believe they were in any way impartial. Uh, I believe they were very much uh, biased towards the neighbors. Um, I think it's no coincidence that when I went in front of Dapper, uh, 
your, your staff based uh, uh, design review uh, committee, uh, which is not subject to neighbor pressure. I received a 71 favorable recommendation on the first proposal, which was larger and higher, and I received a 6 to 1 recommendation on this proposal. Again, uh, in front of uh, uh, technical people who are not subject to neighbor pressure, uh, I got a 6 to 1 uh, favorable recommendation. So I want to point that out. Um, uh, with respect to a build, being a build a lot, I went to the city staff before I put an offer on the, on the property said, I know it would require major variances. I know it's going to be an arduous process. Is this a build a lot? If the city doesn't want anybody building on this lot, I won't buy it. Staff said it is a build a lot, and they said it because it is a build a lot. Legally, it's a build a lot. Um, and municipalities cannot deny uh, uh, the right to build on, on a lot when they have created that lot out of subdivision. They've created the zoning standards that make building on the lot impossible without variance. So that's why staff said it was a buildable lot. That's why I believe it is a buildable lot today and why we're here. Um, now, the neighbors, uh, by and large, are in older homes that were built um, under old rules, okay? and. The lots are predominantly 25 foot wide lots that, that are in the neighborhood. Uh, there are, as you know, and in staff report, several 25 foot wide corner lots. Uh, uh, this house uh, would fit in with the neighborhood. There are other 25 foot wide lots with, with houses on them that, frankly, are larger, have uh, less setbacks than this would have. Uh, so this is not in any way out of character. Um, and. Um, uh, I, I believe out of fairness, uh, the city needs to um, approve this, this ordinance. Now, with respect to a rational decision-making process, deciding by the rules, what are the rules? The rules are the standards for variance that, that um, are in the zoning ordinance. Because this had um, uh, parking within the street side yard, uh, this came before uh, the city council, before your committee and you are the final authority on this. It's not, it doesn't go back to the ZBA, thankfully. Um, so those are the rules, and, and the rules are open to interpretation, obviously. Um, but you can't make up new rules uh, as a means of denying uh, something that is really um, a right. I believe you have an obligation to make a decision by the rules. I was a little dismayed at the last hearing when this matter of heritage trees was brought up. Um, it kind of was a curveball to me because I hadn't heard about uh, heritage trees and, and possibly denying uh, the, these variances based out of uh, heritage trees. Well, heritage trees are, are not defined uh, in, in a city ordinance. There's no city ordinance that says that uh, the city can deny building on a lot by the presence of heritage trees on the lot or on adjacent lot. There's no registry of heritage trees. There's no definitive registry. This is a heritage tree. This is not a heritage, uh, a heritage tree. Um, I am a registered landscape architect. I do know about trees. I've built 22 houses. I've never lost a tree on a lot that I, that I wanted to keep. Um, I frankly have never lost a tree I've transplanted onto uh, a lot. And I do a lot of landscaping on the houses I build. I talked to uh, your uh, forestry, head of your forestry department, Paul D'Agostino, today. I said, What's this heritage tree? He said, well, it's a very loose term. It's, it's ill-defined. It's, it's really very subjective. What's a heritage tree? What's not a heritage tree? I said, well, let me ask you this. If there are two large trees uh, adjacent to a lot, let's say they're 20 feet away from, from where the building would go, um, you know, can those trees be saved through the use of best practices in forestry? He said, yes. There may be a special case where a very, very sensitive tree where... So, it, Mr. It, James, can you kind of yeah, wrap okay. it up? So, the trees are not an issue, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, frankly, drainage is not an issue. If you talk to your own staff about drainage, will drain, we're building a house here affect drainage uh, in the neighborhood or even on the adjacent property? Uh, the answer, you know, would, would be no. It's not going to. Uh, with respect to safety and the alley, uh, there are several uh, garages built three feet off the alley, and I mentioned this in my, my first um, uh, petition. Um, uh, I modified the garage out of, out of deference for the safety issue. Staff has gone one step further and said, we'll take out the open parking space that frankly met the rules for uh, site visibility uh, out of deference to this concern. So um, 
I, I believe that um, the proposal before you very much uh, meets, uh, fits in with the characteristics of the neighborhood. Uh, it is uh, a, a plan that um, uh, meets the standards for variation. There is an obligation, I believe, to improve, approve some house design for this lot. Frankly, I would love to have a little bit of flexibility on the two conditions that staff recommended in terms of um, uh, the roof design and if you wanted to allow the open parking spot, that would be great. Uh, but um, I just wanted, and, and well, I guess I've, I'll, I've said enough here. I, I don't want to. I think you. I think you have a, in the staff report and the materials that were submitted. You have, I believe, all the facts that you need to make a decision. Thank okay, you. Thank you, um, Alderman Wilson. Questions, actually. Oops. Could you? Uh, well, I guess the one, one question at the moment. Do you have a projected uh, or estimated sale price for what the house is going to be listed in, and hopefully, in your eyes, uh, sold for? You know, I really don't. Uh, I have to say I'm, I'm just focused on getting an approval. Uh, typically, um, a, a good sales price would be uh, a sales price that would be consistent with what new houses are going for would be in the range of uh, 225 to 250 a square foot. Um, so. Um, you know, I, I would I would hope to get somewhere in the range of 200 a square foot, and it may be that this house, given you know the small lot and so forth, wouldn't wouldn't get that. Okay, uh, it is it is actually very difficult to predict what a house is going to sell for. I've built 22 of them. Some have sold for what I thought. Some sold for less than what I thought. A couple sold for more than I thought they would. So it, it's very difficult, and frankly. I think that's putting the cart before the horse. Okay. Any there, other, other well, questions? So uh, to save me a little math, do you know what to recall what the square footage of the house is? I was about to look it up here. Um, let's just say it's, if you include the basement, I'm not sure the basement would count fully as, as square footage, but let's say it's 2,000 square feet. Um, so it would be $400,000, $500,000. Okay. Um, any other comments from the committee? Quick, Alderman, yeah, Alderman Wilson. I'll, I'll just be super quick. I, I've, ex I've, I've, I've spent a lot of time with this. I know a number, or maybe all of us have as well, and uh, also struggled with it. I, my, my very, very strong inclination is to want to, you know, make good use of the property, and that is, you know, approve, uh, approve uh, uh, something to be built there. Um, obviously, it's a smaller lot, um, and in the sense of this building, it's it's substandard. My belief uh, and observation in doing this job for 10 years, if so, we've really been working towards a trend of, you know, considering substandard lot sizes and property sizes. But the general idea for me, and I think for the group, is that that's in conjunction with opportunities for more of what I'm going to call affordable housing, you know, market rate affordable housing. Um, you know, this obviously is, you know, it's not a million dollar house, but at the same time, it doesn't really kind of fall into that category. And, and I understand, you know, what you paid for the property, I understand what it costs to build something like this. But, um, you know, to, for me to kind of go that far in the variances, uh, I'm, not, I'm not quite comfortable to, you know, to, to support that in the absence of sort of the overall policy, which is, you know, more affordable housing if we're going to go on a substandard lot size. Okay. Alderman Rainey. Yeah. Thank you. Um, but Alderman Wilson, I, you know, I, we know from dealing with the not-for-profits that affordable housing is unaffordable. The not-for-profits have shown us that to rehab two units of affordable housing is three and four hundred thousand dollars. It's just out of way beyond what we ever suspected. So what I want to know is if our staff has identified this as a buildable lot, what can you build on it? And what is what is the cost of the lot? You you have not bought, purchased this lot, right? You have a, con oh, you, ha you own the lot right now, okay. All right. Can you tell us when you purchased it? I, I don't know what he said. Three years ago in May. Oh, you know, I, please, I, I hate it when that happens. Yeah, it was, it was in the spring of, uh, I guess, 2016. 
Okay, so I'm assuming if you were to buy it today, it would be a little more. So what can can you tell us what you paid for it? I know I could look it up, but yeah. I didn't look it up. So I I paid seventy five thousand dollars for right, it. All right, seventy five thousand. All right. Um, all right. So what what could be built on the lot? Ms. Leonard? Staff. What would staff approve? So I'll ask Scott to come up and speak a little bit more about specifics, but I think the comment that was provided earlier about being a buildable lot, I wasn't present for that conversation, but that often will come up when, when people meet to talk, under, understand a, a concept for a project. And it's usually described as buildable, but you may have to get seek variances depending on what you're, you're seeking. And I don't know if during that meeting, Mr. James said, here's what I'm looking at doing or, or, or what precisely, but that's usually the conversation. We don't say this is not a buildable lot if, it, if it's not, uh, if, if variances aren't available because the variances are available to anyone who wants to seek relief from our zoning code. Right, right. So the next person that comes along is going to have to have variances if they want to build a single family home. That's, that's what's gonna happen. So we're gonna go through this again and it's, now here's a way it's gonna be a buildable lot. It's gonna be a buildable lot if the person next door purchases the lot, their house gets knocked down, and then there's going to be a larger house built, a single family home that's gonna be larger. And so that's gonna make both lots much more valuable. So that probably would be approved and approved by the neighbors. But we're not gonna get I, I think I can predict that we are never going to get a smaller home on that lot. And I think Alderman Wilson, who does this kind of thing for a living, who knows more about real estate on this council than anybody else, we know, you and I know, there's not going to be an affordable home built on that lot. Right? Yeah, we know that. So. And that's why I struggled with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's not gonna be a, and I would predict, mm, I would predict in neighborhoods like the one we're talking about, there probably aren't gonna be any real affordable homes built on small lots. And I, I think we're just gonna to have to accept that. There, with the cost of construction, with the cost of everything, there's, there's just not gonna be affordable homes built. And small homes, single family. And they're not gonna be, I mean, I, I can't wait to find out the details of, this, of the 60 units that are gonna build on Howard Street. The cost of that building is going to be extraordinary. Affordable housing is very expensive. And you can look at any journals, any place, and you're gonna see that just, that's why you need subsidies to keep housing affordable. It's absolutely bottom line. So, there's just anybody, anybody out there who wants to come and buy this lot and build anything, forget about it unless you've got subsidies because it's never gonna happen. The neighbors are never gonna approve it and it's just never gonna happen because you're gonna have to have variances and nobody's gonna want a house that'll fit on that lot with, without variances and you're gonna have to have variances and nobody's gonna want them in the neighborhood. Uh, Alderman Fisk. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Johanna, I wanna ask you a question about the zoning theory. Uh, if we can go there with Scott. Um, so this area is zoned R1, and I think as I brought up at the last meeting, uh, none of these lots that we've been talking about are consistent with R1 zoning. So what was the thought behind the 1993 zoning ordinance was it when something is grandfathered in that the thought is in the future these will turn into larger lots, that the larger lots will uh, join together and become uh, consistent with R1 zoning? Or what, what was the thought behind, behind that? Can you share that with me? The other thing that I, I have to say bothers me is, is um, and I don't know the conversation at all, but if an applicant comes to the city and asks a simple question, is a lot buildable? And we say yes, and this is a question for you, Corporation Council, um, after Johanna, but 
what is our obligation? And that's, I, and I, I worry about that. But Johanna, could you just tell me, because I'm, I'm having a hard time with R1 zoning in this neighborhood at all. I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Scott to maybe weigh in on that. Um, he's more up to date on, on some of the ramifications of zoning codes and the current building trends. Sure. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, unfortunately, I can't speak directly to the 1993 zoning ordinance and, and what particular neighborhoods were zoned. Um, uh, it was pointed out at previous zoning board hearings that many of the lots in this neighborhood are substandard compared to R1 standards and then potentially R2 standards, which is a, another single family zoning district but has a smaller lot size of 5,000 square feet minimum as opposed to 7,200 square feet minimum. Um, would, would have been in 1993 a better zoning more appropriate zoning district for this neighborhood. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, I, I don't have that information about why this was designated for this particular neighborhood. Okay. Thanks. Okay, I, I didn't expect you to, to know why it was, but is, is the thought now, is staff's thought that because it is zoned R1 that we would be looking in the future for lots to consolidate and become more consistent with our R1 zoning parameters? The, uh, for a new lot that was created, if there was a, a larger lot that was being subdivided, it would need to comply with the R1 standards, um, so the 7,200 square foot lot size. However, the zoning ordinance does speak to, to, to non-conforming lots, lots that were created before the 93 zoning ordinance, and essentially says they may be built upon uh, if they comply with the, the requirements of the ordinance. In, in this case, with the 25 foot width and the, the five foot interior side yard and 15 foot um, street side yard, there's, there's some sort of variance that would be needed. Okay, all right. Yes, Corporation Council. Good evening, uh, Michelle Mason, Cup City Attorney. This discussion seems to be circulating around the standard number three uh, and under major variations, which states the alleged hardship or practical difficulty is peculiar to the property. So the applicant has recognized in his comments that he purchased a substandard lot and that the city staff had said, as part of the application, you need to get variances. The city staff had was very clear the variances is part of the process. So uh, the city staff actually acted appropriately. We gave the necessary direction that it is not automatic that you could build on this lot. However, it is buildable. So um, it both are true. Um, and as long as the zoning code allows for a non-conforming lot, it is buildable. It's whether or not you think those variances, um, this requested variance meets the standards that are contained in 63812E. Okay, yeah, thanks. Um, Alderman Wilson. Okay. Uh, sure. So again, with respect to the question of whether it's buildable, I believe that um, the question has been answered that it is buildable. Uh, the matter of variance is in, in question here. So uh, there's a right to build a house on this lot. The question is whether this house meets the variance standards. And coming up before the ZBA twice, and they denied me twice unanimously, and the question is, okay, this doesn't meet the, what meets the, well, we can't give you any direction on what kind of a house would meet the standards. So when you get denied again and again and again, oh, this doesn't meet it, this doesn't meet it, this doesn't meet it, you know, they're, they're not willing to approve any house on this, on this lot, which is what I think is the case. And furthermore, I would ask you, there are other 20 houses on 20 foot wide lots in this neighborhood. Let's suppose one of them burned down. Okay, by ordinance, you're not allowed to rebuild on a non-conforming lot without getting the same variances I'm asking for. So would you allow that homeowner to rebuild the same or similar house on that corner lot? And if you would, then you should approve this application as well. It's the same principle involved. It is the very same principle involved. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, well, uh, I was among my colleagues who walked around the neighborhood uh, quite a bit on Sunday. Um, you may recall at the first uh, Planning and Development Committee meeting when we talked about this property, I um, said I had gone to visit the site and I had almost missed it because it was so small. Um, but when I went back this time, I was doing it in the context of the um, discussion we've been having and the 
um, information in our packet um, uh, that really did point out um, the fact that there were a lot of these substandard lots in the in the neighborhood. And so as I walked around, I did see a lot of basically 25 foot wide lots. I saw a lot of houses that seemed to have basically three foot um, side yards um, from their immediate neighbors. So the, the houses um, looked to me very similar in, in sort of the side yard setbacks um, to what um, this proposal is. Um, there's even, there are even several houses, uh, the other, so the interior side yard setback of three feet seemed to be um, comparable to a lot of what I saw in some of the other um, properties around the neighborhood. Um, then there's the um, three and a half foot side street side yard setback on Hartzell, and I had initially thought, you know, that that would be, you know, just much too close to the sidewalk. But um, there are, in fact, several houses in that neighborhood that have a similar setback from the sidewalk. Um, so. Um, so I, I became, frankly, comfortable with the proposed side yard setbacks. Um, the, the proposed house is smaller than what was originally proposed and what we talked about at planning and development the last time. Um, it has a smaller footprint. It's um, reduced the extension into the backyard. Um, the lot coverage is now closer to the requirement. The requirement says 30% lot coverage, and this is now 365 percent coverage um, and an improved sight line somewhat in the alley by getting rid of the parking pad. Um, coming into the meeting, I have to say storm, the stormwater runoff question was really a major concern and now I've heard some really pretty disturbing um, uh, st story of a, a similar house in South Evanston um, and I guess I I would somehow want some kind of assurance from staff that there'd be, I, I don't know if the, if the problem is because of, a, of the basement that um, then uh, makes it so difficult to deal with the stormwater runoff. Um, and if the, if the water table is truly just a few inches down below the surface, um, I, I don't think we want to be having a house that goes in that needs a sump pump that's running 24 hours a day. Um, so I have to say, I'm, I'm, I thought I knew what I was going to do when I came into the meeting, but now I'm not sure. Um, I, I also think that um, I personally uh, do think we want to be able to build on smaller lots. I think they do afford an opportunity to create um, perhaps not totally affordable housing, but certainly lower cost housing um, that would be more of a starter home that a lot of families um, would find to be very attractive. So I, I, I think the allowing uh, buildings to go on to these substandard lots is, is an important public policy. Um, so as I say, I'm conflicted. Alderman Wynn. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, I, I have to say that um, I, I do think the neighbors have a lot of serious concerns here. Uh, you know, I, this neighborhood was originally built uh, before we had the standards that we have now. And, uh, and so I think one of the key things is not to aggravate issues uh, or not to repeat um, things that we wouldn't necessarily do again. Uh, so I do think the setbacks, especially the interior side yard setback, is a um, serious concern to me. I also think that the stormwater issue is uh, one that I, I find um, insurmountable. I have a house that was built in the third ward with a nine-foot basement uh, where the water table was um, is very high in this particular location, and it has a sump pump that runs continuously. The lot is large enough that it disperses the water. Uh, but uh, when it was built, I did actually know, I don't know now, the amount of gallons that it um, produced um, every day, and it was extraordinary. So, but that lot was is very large, and, um, and it was possible to do that. Uh, the expense of it was huge. So I, you know, when these pictures of the, the nearby yards, um, clearly indicate that the water table is very high. So I think uh, that would have a very negative impact on the, the value of the homes nearby. So 
you know, I'm, I'm disinclined to approve this. I also think this is a lot that, um, you know, I recognize your expertise, but for this amount of money, there obviously was, there were con concerns about whether, uh, what you could possibly build on it. And another option would have been to purchase it with contingencies, you know, zoning contingency. Well, um, that was a risk. Right, but that, but that's a, but that's a, that's another way of protecting yourself when it's a tricky lot like this. Um, I do think that, frankly, that I think that if there are other empty lots like this in the city, uh, I think we need to look at them um, and figure out: Do we have a? Should we have a different standard um, of of what the setbacks are, or um, a different height limitation, something like that, um, or should we de deem them unbuildable? Um, uh, and, and figure out what happens legally then. Uh, so, you know, I, I can't support um, this proposal. Uh, I, I think it's a very nice house, but it's not on the right spot. Okay, uh, Alderman Ruth Simmons. Thank you. Um, I would like to um, take every opportunity to look at what can happen and not um, deem them unbuildable, but this project is um, just not right for this lot, so I'm not going to be supporting it. Okay, um, Alderman Fisk and then Alderman Rainey. Um, another question for um, Johanna. Um, can you, was this last iteration, did that come before Dapper? Uh, the the piece the, that's in the packet? Yeah. No, it did not. Okay, and um, why not? The suggested changes were resulted from the discussion that had occurred here and uh, in order to um, remove, in increase the permeable surface, he, uh -huh. the parking pad was removed at as well as to increase the site triangle. So those were suggestions that had been made that Mr. James uh, incorporated into, this, into the design so they were part of this, this deliberation. Okay. I'm, I'm I mean, like Alderman Ravel, I'm, I'm really confused. <laughs> I have no idea how I'm going to vote. I'm glad somebody else is. <laughs> um, Alderman Rainey. Um, do we know what the water table is there? I mean, I, I, I don't know that because Alderman Wynn's water table is very high that a water table in the sixth ward is high. Just we have photos. Oh, okay. Yes, you, you All mentioned right. the water Once table. Once again, I saw the water table. So how, what, when you say that, what do you mean? What I mean is they drove down in Kathy Miller's house next door, and they went through the foundation because there was something going on. And as they went through the foundation, the water table was like this far below the foundation. I actually saw it. That's how far it is. Okay. And it's that way for all over. Two houses down, they have an underwater creek going through his house. Mm -hmm. Water is a big issue in terms of how far the water table is. Okay. Um, well, I. I I, th I think we need to wrap up our conversation here. So are we... Uh, but um, I have another question. Oh, Alderman Rainey, yes. Um, may I, I want to ask um, Ms. Uh, Leonard, Ms. Len Mrs. Leonard, <laughs> um, why, since there have been so many changes, what if, what if Dapper thought this was a, a excellent uh, resolution to their previous um, observations. I'm sorry. The, the I'm, I'm wondering, I'm wondering, has, has this become a much better house? Even though the, let's say, I mean, I understand the neighbors don't like it. They don't, they don't want this house there. But maybe, maybe in terms of being a, 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 a better house, and I think we want better houses all over town, that maybe this is a, a, a better quality house and would fit better on this property. 
Well, could, um, I, I mean, mean, I know Alderman Wilson thinks it's too expensive. I think it's probably <laughs> as affordable a house as you can put on this, and maybe that he would approve it if they thought if they thought it was as as um, economical as possible. Right. Well, I'm just. I think to answer your question, I mean, Dapper did approve. I know, six to one, yeah, right. I know. So, but so this, but maybe this is um, more, um, I think this is better design, probably. Mm. I mean, you don't want a cheap house in this nice neighborhood, no. right? Right. I mean, a tacky house, we don't want that. They, these people don't want that in their neighborhood. I mean, you can't, this is, all right. Alderman Wilson. Thank you. And, you know, in the end, um, you know, it could be a cautionary tale. So, you know, sometimes you have to be careful what you wish for. So if we say no to this, someone will come up with some kind of creative use. Maybe that is, you know, three of those little tiny homes. So I don't know that people would want three tiny homes, but that might work. And that might be, you know, zoning wise, uh, something that would be uh, more acceptable. So um, I just kind of caution everybody that, you know, you, I understand all the points that are being made, but once those points are made and it's, you know, pushed into a, a certain finite range, um, you might get something that you hadn't really expected. So, uh, so just you know, be be thoughtful and conscientious about that. Uh, D uh, Director Stoneback, I th maybe you can answer this um, water table issue. It sounds like, from looking at the pictures and hearing some of the neighbors, maybe there's just kind of some sort of engineering challenge in this block or this area. Uh, good evening, Dave Stomach, Public Works Director. <clears throat> I'm unfamiliar with the uh, level of the water table in this particular area, but I do know uh, if you build a basement below the water table level that your sump pump will run continuously 24-7. Mm -hmm. It's just your all the pipes around your building, the drain tile, pick up that water, put it in a sump pit, and then the sump pit continually pumps it out. We've noticed that at several properties in Evanston. And it, over time, it becomes a problem. Uh, I think you heard a speaker earlier tonight that said they did some changes. That worked for a while, but once the ground gets saturated again, it, it just starts keeping up on the surface level of the property. And then uh, by ordinance, they have to be four foot away from the property line where they discharge their stormwater. That's generally by the alley, but then it just finds its way out into the alley causes an issue even in the winter time as well because it will continue to discharge and then it freezes up in the alley and we have several concerns with that as well. Now um, I'm assuming you're not familiar with the property. Would it be an option to have your staff you know you know take a look at this? I mean you know if, if the situation is if nobody's going to be able to realistically build uh, a full basement then it you know it would be useful if they knew that you know before you know they or anybody else you know, so generally we we don't do that we require that of the of the of engineer the, okay the, of the, of the okay. builder of the right, developer right. to do a water table search first and then based on those results uh, community development decides whether or not to allow that depth of the basement okay well maybe that's something that we should uh, we should ask to have looked at right. in the context of this proposal in the context, yeah, in the context of this proposal, no, it's not for you, but you know, I, I, you know, I certainly, I recognize it's it's dragging out and it's more work and all of this, but at the same time, you know, my general philosophy is you don't want to make it worse, so mm -hmm. I, I don't want to make it worse, um, and if it's just not if it's not feasible, you also don't want to you know lay a foundation, and then have everybody you know coming back at you, yeah. So of, of the 22 houses I've built, there was one house that, uh, I'm not sure if it's the house that this um, uh, objector uh, referenced, uh, the house was uh, 544 Wesley. I built on two, two lots side by side. Uh, the addresses were 542 Wesley and 544 Wesley. Uh, 544 Wesley did go down into uh, the water table, um, and especially when uh, the building is new, and uh, the excavation, the backfill is 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 new and is not compressed. Uh, the water, uh, groundwater, will be drawn to the void uh, that's around the foundation wall and the drain tile and so forth. And and water did um, uh, go into the sump pump. The sump pump was going continuous. Now the house right next to it, uh, 540 uh, uh, 2 Wesley, did not have the same problem. 
okay? So this is a very localized condition. I don't think you know until you, you dig down. It also, there is a seasonal high water table, so in the springtime when the ground is saturated, when there's not much uh, evaporation occurring, the water table is higher than in uh, the height of summer when there is evaporation, the water table is lower. Um, so I guess, you know, that is my experience with that. Over time, that one house, uh, when the, uh, the backfill and compression of uh, uh, dirt against the foundation did settle, uh, the infiltration of, of groundwater into the drain tile uh, reduced and, and, and lessened, and I don't think it's a problem today. Um, uh, what I would ask is, if this is, you know, a deciding issue, I would be happy to look into it. If, uh, if it turned out I couldn't build a basement, um, would that change the opinion on this uh, on this uh, on this matter? Um, and if that's the case, um, you know, then I would be happy to check into the groundwater um, and um, revise the plans accordingly. Okay. Thank you. Um, Alderman Fisk. Uh, well, that's, I, I mean, it's interesting if the neighbors, the other neighbors aren't having a, a, yes, a, prob exactly. a problem with it. I, I think that's, that's interesting. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering if, I mean, we are encouraging smaller, hopefully affordable houses on smaller lots. I mean, that's uh, the direction that we've been moving in. I mean, would we as a committee accept this if there were no variances involved? Um, would we be obligated to accept it if there's no variances involved? Or no how way. would that? I, I think they ha must seek variances, right? Johanna, just the uh, right. if there were dimensions of This the wouldn't lot. be here if there weren't variances. But the variances are the size of the lot, right? The, what, are, what are the other variances? The side yard. Set, the yeah, but if they met the side yard, let's just say they met the side yard setbacks. What? If they met the side yard setbacks but not the other variances, is that what you're asking? I, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to get a sense of what, what it is we're looking for on this lot. I, I think I, from the conversation that's been happening so far, I think we're struggling with that. You know, it, is this, because of variances. this is a buildable lot, so what's buildable on it? It's is, buildable because of variances. That's all. Yeah, no, I, I understand that, and Michelle explained that really well, but there has to be an answer to it, and I'm struggling with That's that. That's the answer. So my other question was, I don't know where Dave has gone. Um, Mr. Stonebeck is... I'm asking for him to come back. Uh, yeah, no, I, yeah, yeah, I, I know. Um, we're waiting for Dave for just a sec. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about about water tables because we learned a lot from the um, the Kendall project, hmm. where um, apparently <laughs> there was a huge water problem, and the way that we dealt with that was, um, and this rarely happens, but going to MWRD and asking if the water could be. Um, flushed into the fresh water system. Mm -hmm. MWRD never agrees to that. And Dave, could you just, I'm trying to talk about Kendall and I, I don't want to get anything really wrong. But um, so M MWRD rarely, if ever, accepts putting groundwater into the fresh water system. I, in that case, there were backyards that had water in them all the time. But the developer sought a variation and was ultimately granted with the city's help. Correct. So, one, the city of Evanston doesn't want stormwater going into its combined sewer system. Mm -hmm. We're vastly undersized and we surcharge under rain events. Uh, and we spent $210 million to try to prevent that. So, it's not sound business then to allow people to hook some pumps up to these small pipes. In the case of Kendall College, uh, there was a relief sewer, which has no basements connected to it that if it hooked up to that, we're just taking a little bit of capacity away from that sewer. We're not jeopardizing any basements. Uh, and then, yes, they were able to get a revised, they were able to get a permit from the district allowing that to occur, but the city had to say it was okay as well. But that's very rare that that happens. That is the only property that I'm aware of, and it wasn't just a property. It was that whole complex involving 
16 or 18 homes. 18, 18 houses were affected right. by that. Um, right. So I, I, I don't know. Again, I don't know what the answer to this is. There seems to be different ways of looking at it. I think the, the, the groundwater is a big issue here. And, and at Kendall College, that was something that went on for two and a half to three years before they took those actions. So it wasn't like it went away after compaction or anything like that. It was a, if you build below the ground table level, it, you're going to have some pumps continuously discharging. Right. So I'm not I'm not sure uh, to the developer how you how you address this, but that would be something that if I were looking at building on this site, I would certainly want to look at before I proceeded with this. And I don't know whether we as a committee want to grant him time to look at it or not. But um, and I haven't even gotten into my concerns about the trees, so that's, that's a whole other a whole um, other thing. But uh, again, I think all all of this is helpful. But I think you know, listening to the neighbors and their concerns. I mean, a larger property, we would, we would put a vault in, right? It's, if it were a larger development, we would do that. They could do that, but again, if you're below the ground table, groundwater table, and It'll you continually discharge, at some point whatever you create is going to be overwhelmed by that water right. if it right. continues to run on a continuous basis. Right, right. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Corporation Council, do we have any, what are our options procedurally? Can well, we? One thing I just wanted to mention, under the city code under 4-20-4-1, developments requiring stormwater control, it simply states all new developments shall provide stormwater control for the entire property. So this subject is a new development, so it would be subject to those provisions. It goes on for additional restrictions if there's a larger lot size, but I would anticipate that uh, during the final DEPA review, whatever stormwater control mechanism that the developer seeks, Ingrid and uh, city staff would have objections and the proposal would be vetted. Um, okay, and in terms of what we can do as a committee, we've already tabled this. It, it, and are there, can we hold it at all or? I would assume it's already been held I, based on past okay. history so that it's out. Okay. So maybe we just introduce it to council and keep it going. Right. Yeah, we could we could introduce it to council and ask for somebody to look into the water table, for example. Sure. But, um, all, I had Alderman Rainey and then Alderman Sufferden. Um, so we're we're concerned about this water table, and I mean, we have, this water table. The water table runs over under everybody's property all over the city, and this has come up because. Of all the properties um, Bill has developed all over town, there was one incident. And it appears as though there was another incident in this neighborhood. And um, I, I don't think it's a common problem. It, when it happens, it's very unfortunate. And um, there's no reason to think it's going to happen again, but it could. But I, I don't think. I think it's a good idea to hold this up to see if if he can look into it and remedy any possibility that it would happen again. Um, but I, I think it's unfortunate that we're singling him out as as being somebody who's likely to cause this problem again. So anyway, I just wanted to say that on his behalf because I know him to be a responsible person and it's unfortunate that it happened before and I feel badly for the guy that was the recipient of the problem. Okay, so. Alderman Sufferden. Um, I think we got sidetracked with the water table discussion. Yeah, I do too. And, uh, Let's go back an hour and a half or so to everything that these people said. Um, I think Mr. James is a diligent and reasonable person, but he used a colloquialism earlier uh, where he said, you know, this isn't the house I want to build, but I can live with it. And he was saying I can live with it in the colloquial sense. These people would have to live with it in the actual real, it's on their block sense, and it's too big for the lot. That's the bottom line. Uh, you can talk about the water table, you can talk about the visibility of the alley, all these things add up to that this house is too big for the lot. Now. You know, Mr. James asked for guidance on what could be built there. That's not our place, but this shouldn't be built there. And I'm just going to ask that everyone who spoke today when we vote consider just rejecting it rather than kicking it to council for another demonstration like this. I mean, this has been a three-year process. Mr. James has known about the drainage and water issues since the day he bought it. So if you want to give it more time, at least be honest with yourselves. It's not because he's researching something that he was unaware of. This has been 
something he's known about since day one. It's been a small lot since before he bought it. He was aware of it. He chose to buy it. This is the plan he's proposing. Let's reject it. Okay. Uh, Alderman Fisk. Okay, if, if we do reject this, it's, he can come back with something else smaller. Is that right? He, no? He can't. He can't? What? A whole new proposal. Well, be a, a new yeah. application, but it's Right, uh, and it would start over again. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Are we ready to vote? Yes. Okay. Um, so we have a motion uh, before us, and obviously the ordinance language itself would have to be revised to reflect the newest version of the proposal, but the motion before us is to uh, move uh, to send to the council for introduction the um, the most recent proposal for 2626 Reese Avenue. Um, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed say no. 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 So I think it's um, however many of us knows and one eye. So, all right. Thank you, everybody. We have one more business item. Where's my agenda? Oh, there it is. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, this is uh, item P2, ordinance 32-0-19, granting a special use and zoning relief for an automobile service station and convenience store at 140 Chicago Avenue. Um, uh, this Alderman Rainey is requesting suspension of the rules for introduction and action um, at the April 22nd uh, council meeting. Uh, Alderman Rainey. Um, you want to move, move Did you move, move introduction? Uh, I, okay. Okay. I, I want to second that. Okay. Okay. Yep. Um, I just want to clarify, just in case it's not real clear, this it's not going to be built upon or anything. It's going to be completely down, and everything, including pumps, is all going to be new. It's going to be total new construction, and I am totally in support of it. All the neighbors are the. Um, um, the Howard Street Business Association is very supportive, so I am asking for a suspension of the rules so this can be done. It's going to be fabulous. It really needs this improvement. Yeah. Okay. Any other discussion? Uh, then all in favor of this motion to for introduction and action of Ordinance 32-0-19, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. All right. Um, items for discussion or communications. I would just like to remind everybody to fill out the public benefits survey to, so we can return to council with that. Um, I will have staff recirculate it again. Um, so it, it's all right. We, I think we were, we're going to push it into June now, but I just, yeah. just remind you. Yeah. Okay. It's okay. It's okay. okay. All right. I second the motion. Um, so, do I have a motion to adjourn? Adjourn. Second. Okay, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Okay, aye. thank you very much.